Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So welcome everybody to the first of the Erga Biogenome Analysis and Application Seminars. I'm Teresa Manusaki from my MBBC at CMR in Iraqi in Greece, and I'm co-chairing Erga's Data Analysis Committee together with Rosa Fernandez from Institute of Evolutionary Biology of CSIC in Barcelona. So this uh, newly launched uh, seminar series is organized jointly by Erga's Data Analysis Committee and the Biodiversity Genomics Europe Work Package 11, which focuses on the applications of genome references. From September and on, so not in July and August, but from September and on, it will be a monthly seminar. The main focus of uh, the series will be on data analysis and applications. So in other words, on what we can do with our high quality and annotated reference genomes. It will include talks on uh, five directions. So we will have seminars on uh, population genomics, on comparative genomics, on functional genomics, and on phylogenomics that correspond to the four DAC data analysis committee subcommittees, and to the applications to conservation by economy, which is also the direction of today's talk. Um, to give more space to analysis and applications, each uh, seminar will include three parts. The first will be the standard 20 minutes presentation of the scientific topic. Then we'll have another 20 minutes uh, devoted to a more detailed aspect of the presented work. So this could be a particular analysis of software, interactions with stakeholders and so on. Um, and finally, we'll have another 20 minute session for discussion. So having done this small introduction, I will leave the floor to Jose Melo Ferreira, Who's lead, who leads Work Packet 11 of BD and is also a member of the DAC Steering Committee to introduce to us our amazing speakers. Thank you, Teresa. So it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our speakers today. So um, I would like to welcome Leif Anderson, uh, who is a professor of functional genomics at Uppsala University in Sweden uh, and in animal genomics at Texas A&M University in the US. Um, Leif has done amazing work on gene uh, genetics and genome biology. Uh, he studied the um, relationship between um, genetic and phenotypic variation, genetic basis for domestication, but has also uh, studied, uh, used genomic tools to study natural populations, such as the evolution of Darwin finches and their beaks, um, uh, male mating strategy in the rough, uh, genetic basis of ecological adaptation in Atlantic herring and other fish species. And uh, he's leading a, a, one of the case studies from um, the genome applications uh, work package uh, in uh, the Biodiversity Genomics Europe project. Um, and, uh, and today you will tell us about how fish population genomics can promote sustainable fisheries. I will now already introduce our second speaker, uh, who is Jake Goodall. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher studying fish population genetics and genomics at, uh, at Uppsala University in Sweden. Uh, he has done his PhD uh, at the University of Queensland, uh, Australia, then uh, postdoctoral studies at the University of Iceland, and now is at uh, Uppsala University. And the second part of the talk, as Therese explained, today will be devoted to um, the, the development of bioinformatic pipelines for fish uh, population assignment using snip ship data. Um, and so now I will leave the floor first to Leif uh, and then to Jake. And I would like to thank you uh, both for um, accepting our invitation uh, to kickstart this uh, exciting seminar series. Okay, does it look good? Uh, not yet, but you're... your screen sharing is paused. Is it like that? Okay, you can try again, maybe. So while Leif is sharing the screen, uh, I'm just uh, saying that at the end, please feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Feel free to post these questions if you're in the chat, if you're in the Zoom uh, call, and also if you're watching through YouTube, uh, also you can, uh, uh, post your questions over there in the chat, okay? So, Leif, go ahead. Yeah, no, it looks good, right? Yeah. 
fine. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> as you hear, that we will talk about how fish population genomics can promote sustainable fisheries. And let's start by illustrating that from an illustration from the first book that was published for the Swedish market from in 1555, which illustrate the life in the north and how important fishery was. So sometimes when the fish are spawning, they're, they're, the, the schools are so dense that if you put an ax in the water, it will not sink, it will stand on the shoulder of all the fish. So that is in the old time. So I also would like to mention that we have a paper coming out in annual, annual review in animal biosciences from my group and, and colleagues where we show how we think we, can, we could use population genomics in fisheries. Uh, so sustainable fishery depends on accurate stock assessment to avoid overfishing. And this is one of the classical example of, of a collapse of a, of a stock. Of, so this is the cod fishery east of Newfoundland. And uh, I was born 54 and during my childhood, you know, the, there was this frequent food in school that we got fish fingers made from cod from this area. And, but then in the 90s, it collapsed and then it couldn't come back. So what is, what is important for um, uh, fishery management is to have accurate information on population structure. And it's very important to know the age distribution of individual populations, because then you could see how recruitment is taking place and you could predict the future development of stocks and, and when it's time to reduce fishing and uh, to avoid collapses like that. Because you could have a, a cohort which is very strong and it's very important for fishery, but, when that, but it may take time before you get an, another big, uh, strong cohort. And ideally, fishing quota should be set by population rather by, than by geographic region. Nowadays, quotas are set by region, and then uh, fishery biologists has an opinion about which stocks or populations are present in that area. But ideally, it, it would be to determine which population you are fishing on, and then uh, set the fishing quota, what is suitable for that specific population. So what we present in this paper is a roadmap, uh, the different steps that is needed. And, and the first step is, of course, to make a genome assembly. And I will discuss why I think a, genome, a high quality genome assembly is really important for these marine species. And uh, next step is to identify genetic markers that this, and you do that by population resequencing. So you collect samples from the species distribution, resequence them, align to the assembly, and identified regions of genetic differentiation. In the next phase, you design SNP arrays and do testing on populations to get very accurate allele frequency from, from, many, from all the populations you're interested to monitor. And in the fourth step, then you can then uh, collect fish from mixed samples and determine what is the relative proportions of the different populations that you have defined in, in, in this step, so to speak. So, so fish population exploited in commercial fishing are large, if not huge. This is a picture of uh, herring, Norwegian herring, the Norwegian spring spawning herring, which is the biggest stock of herring in the world. It's about 100 billion individuals is the breeding stock. And a, a single a uh, school of, of herring can be up to a billion individuals. So a characteristic feature then is low genetic drift and, and very low or no genetic differentiation of neutral markers, which means that for, for in a small population, you, you will find a genetic differentiation all across the genome, but, but in, in these species, it may be much more restricted. That you could say is more difficult to find genetic markers, but but the advantage if you for, for research is that often very strong signals of selection and, and, the, and these signals of selection is often have a very high resolution because in a, in a, in a large population, the decay of linkage is equilibrium is much faster than in a small population. So top 10 species in commercial fishery 2019 is these 10 here with a the top one is the anchovy, the Peruvian anchovy, 
where the total catch that year was 4.9 billion kilograms. So almost every person on the earth has one kilogram of peruvian anchovy. And this is then followed by, so Atlantic herring is on the number four here. I, highlight blue whiting here as number six, because that is one of the species that we have selected for this case study. And what you could say is that these top species are, are primarily clupids, anchoveta, herring, uh, sardine, two different species of sardines. You have cod species, Alaska pollock, uh, blue whiting, and then two, two species of tunas and then mackerel species. So this belong also to the mackerel family. And Atlantic mackerel is the second species we use for this case study. Um, so so th this is what I mentioned that many of these species show very little genetic differentiation selected neutral loci. And Atlantic herring is a, is a model for this. And, and this is in fact from my um, graduation project that I did more than 40 years ago. And this was before we could use DNA, so we use isozyme markers. And, and but this time we could do allozymes. We, we started 13 loci. <clears throat> the amazing thing, and we, we collected fish from on the Atlantic Ocean here and, and the North Sea, Skagra, Kattegat, all the way. So the salinity up here is three per mil and it's 35 per mil up here. And the remarkable thing was that all these populations had the same alleles and at the same frequencies. So you'll see that illustrated with one of the alleles that we identified. So basically the same allele frequency. So the data looked like it was from a single um, uh, pamnictic population. So why is high quality genome assemblies needed? Well, that is to make sure that the most informative genetic markers are identified. And the chromosome level assembly also facilitates the interpretation of data. And I illustrate that with this compare of Atlantic herring data where we do genome wide association between spring and autumn spawning populations. So this is our first generation assembly, which is uh, based only on Illumina sequencing. So a highly fragmented library. Whereas this is based on, on a chromosome based uh, assembly. And what we could see then is that these two signals here is in fact coming from an inversion on chromosome six. So that is one signal. And these two signals is from the same region on chromosome 15, where we have the TSHR locus, what I think is the key gene for determining spawning time in the herring. So <clears throat> this is another contrast. Here we compare populations from uh, Ireland, Br uh, British waters, and then from the North Atlantic. So basically these, pop so these are all the samples that we have an analyzed in the herring. So this is the, the population against those which are in the North here, Iceland, Greenland, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. And, and, and you could see here that there's not many signals of selection, but the one we see is very convincing. So this is the p-values 10 to the minus 80 here. So sometimes, this could be extremely uh, sharp. So in fact, this is a single snip that stands out on chromosome two in this contrast. And this is a missense mutation in the ligand binding domain of a transcription factor. We're pretty sure that this is the, is the is a causal mutation. But these four highlighted here are inversions that we identify. And uh, so this is a very typical signal for inversions that this has been maintained over a long period of time. You have very high linkage equilibrium within the inversions, but super sharp borders to markers outside the inversions. And that's because you have, a, if these are old polymorphism, then recombination has exploit, uh, excluded all linkage equilibrium outside the inversion. And in fact, the, the data we have is indicate that so if you take this chromosome 12, for instance, so these are Pacific herring, the sister species. This is from homozygous for the North allele and these from the South allele. And you could see that the distance between these is larger, but not so much larger than between the two species. So we conclude that these are a million year old or, or older. So this, 
Inversion polymorphies have evolved over a very long period of time and contributed very significantly to uh, ecological adaptation in the Atlantic herring. So this is another example of strong genetic differentiation between Atlantic herring and Baltic herring. So remember now that Atlantic herring it lives in fully marine environment, Baltic herring uh, stays in, in, in brackish environment. Linnaeus classified Baltic herring as a subspecies of the Atlantic herring because it's smaller, less fat and, and uh, adapted to this. And we have, as you see, once again, very, very convincing signals of selection. This is when we look only at spring spawners and this when we look at only at autumn spawners and, and some of these loci is found in, in, in both autumn spawners and, and, and spring spawners. This is an ion channel. This is prolactin receptor, which is very important for osmoregulation in fish. This is rhodopsin, and I just wanted to highlight that because in this case, we is, is quite sure that this is the causal mutation, phenylalanine to tyrosine at 261. So, you know, as a geneticist, you could look at tyrosine and phenyl phenylalanine. If you make an alignment of all fish species that have been sequenced, you find at this position, you only find tyrosine or phenylalanine. And maybe as a geneticist, you could say, well, probably this is neutral, they are so similar. But the thing is that a hydroxyl molecule could make a big difference in a protein. And if you look, the strategic position of this is that this hydroxyl group is facing retinol where light absorption takes place. And in fact, we know that this mutation is causing a red shift in absorbance of about 10 nanometers. And if you, uh, this is satellite data which showed a reflection of light and the Baltic Sea is red shifted. Black here means the, the derived allele at, tyros, at, at this rhodopsin. So here is 100% of the Baltic uh, herring variant, so to speak. Whereas in the Atlantic, they are all white, which means that they have all 100% phenylalanine. So what was amazing with this finding was that when we now, so I said that all fish species <clears throat> has either phenylalanine or tyrosine. But if you look more carefully, what you will learn is that it basically every fish species in the world living in a pelagic environment has phenylalanine. But one third of all fish living in freshwater or brackish water has tyrosine as disposition. So this mutation has happened independent at least 20 times. So I think it's one of the most amazing examples of convergent evolution at the molecular level. So what we could say from, from this, this analysis is that this gives, this analysis gives a completely new view of the population structure of the Atlantic herring. And it provides diagnostic markers that can be used to distinguish all major subpopulations. And if you look at the, this map here, so this is the North Sea here, and it's, that's an area for very important fishery. So when the UK was leaving the Union, fishing quotas outside here, but also in this area was really important for the negotiations. And in this area, herring spawning uh, on the British coast, Norwegian coast, Danish coast, even herring from this area migrate out here and you have, so this is this, what we have, the structure we have identified, different populations in the Baltic Sea. Transition zone is this zone here, Atlantic Ocean spring spawners, autumn spawners. This is the, uh, around Ireland and Britain, there is heterogeneity among these as well. These are Norwegian fjord populations. And several of these are mixing here. And it's a major fishery is taking place here. And now we have the tools to really dissect exactly what proportions of these populations are catched in, in this area. And, and where, did, because you could define the, the population based on where they're spawning, but to track them over the outside spawning is what you can do now with these genetic markers that we have developed. And, but it's important to see that, that population structure vary, of course, a lot between different species. And, and one species where we see no genetic differentiation is the European eel. So the European eel is one single panmictic population that breed in the Sargasso Sea. And then uh, uh, the larvae drift over the Atlantic and then they colonize different 
brackish and freshwater environment. And when we collect yields from the Baltic Sea against rest of Europe and North Africa, there's absolutely no signs of, of genetic differentiation bet between them, which means, which is of course important information, which means that all countries having the European yield need to collaborate to, uh, uh, to maintain yield, which has drastically reduced in number during the last 30, 40 years. So, so when, when you're serving glass eels in Portugal and, and Spain, that will affect the number of eels that will return to, to Sweden 10 years later or so. So what determines population structure? Well, I would say life history parameters, homing behavior, and I, I would say variation in environmental conditions during reproduction. So the reason why there's so much structure in the herring is because the herring is spawning quite close to, to the shore and it's spawning at, at, uh, during different conditions as regard temperature, salinity, depth of water, time of the year, and so on. And for that reason, the homing behavior allow them to adapt to these different environments. And then mating behavior, you could say that in, so the herring, for instance, is a broadcast spawner that is aggregating and then is releasing sperm into the water. But I, I would say we, we are amazed to see that there is so much structure in the herring and, and we're looking forward to see what happens with the other. So our ongoing DGE project, so it's work package 11.2.1, is to do a genome assembly and population sequencing of the Atlantic mackerel and blue whiting. So you see here, blue whiting is about 1.5 million ton fished annually. Uh, Atlantic mackerel is half about that. But the thing is that blue whiting is used to produce fish meal. So I don't think it's used for, for human consumption at all. But Atlantic mackerel is very important for human consumption. So I could think that the economic value of this is even is higher than for, for blue whiting. And the aim is to, to, to establish high quality genome and then study population structure and develop the possible, the best possible diagnostic genetic markers to allow uh, stock monitoring. So the stakeholders here, so the, the structure which there are these ISIS, International Council for the Exploration of Sea. So they are the group that is monitoring uh, stocks of fish and then uh, give advice with regard to fishing quotas to the EU advisory councils for fishery that determine fishing quotas for, for Europe. And another stakeholder is the European Association of Fish Producers, which are the one that is uh, um, doing fishing and, and marketing of fish products. So the status here is that the Darwin Tree of Life is, uh, is, is doing the genome assemblies. And according to the information I get, the assembly should be ready in August, September. And then for, this is what is funded within the BGE project. And here we have collected the samples and uh, we are ready to sequence them basically when we have an assembly. I will end by just mentioning that we have developed a multi-species SNP chip for fish population genetic analysis. So it's developed in collaboration with the company. But the whole idea is to, because SNP chip analysis, it's expensive to produce chips, but if you could share the, the cost for developing it by using it in multiple species, you could get down the cost to, to very reasonable. So we have seven species of, of fish that is on the chip. And there's 3,000 to 4,000 SNPs per species. And the cost is about 20 euro per, per individual, including DNA preparations. And our ambition is to, to add mackerel and blue whiting to this collection uh, when we have finalized this project so that it, that could be used for future stock management. And with that, I end and give the word to Jake. Thanks, Leif, for your amazing example of uh, biodiversity application using genomics. Um, so, Jake, go ahead. Okay, you can hear me and see the screen? Yes. Great. All right, so just bouncing off Leif's talk, um, I guess I wanted to present some of the developments in the bioinformatic pipelines uh, 
that involve the, the multi snip uh, species uh, fish array that Leif just mentioned, um, primarily for from the focus of herring. Uh, so much of this work uh, largely uh, stems or is possible due to the, the high quality genome that Leif uh, talked about, and also the work that went into identifying very informative uh, SNP markers. So Leif introduced this PCA plot. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, we see seven sort of major groupings uh, or populations inherent within the, the herring stocks. Uh, this is, that was a, a PCA plot that was uh, built based on about 800 SNP loci, um, but there is many more. And uh, this is where the design and testing of the, the chip array uh, is involved. So much of the sort of selection of the, uh, the loci was done looking at various different contrasts. Uh, Leif introduced some of these earlier. So looking at, for example, spring and autumn spawners and highly differentiated SNP between those groups. And for example, Baltic Sea and Atlantic Ocean individuals. So many, many contrasts went into the sort of selection phase. Um, so for example, regional contrasts, um, looking at, for example, the British Isles and the North Atlantic, um, and for example, pelagic uh, versus fjord individuals, uh, various other different contrasts. There was a small amount of sort of VICP SNP. Um, this is primarily SNP that had previously been used for more local SNP panels. Uh, for example, the UK was using a SNP panel of about 52 uh, individual SNP. Um, and so we wanted to sort of bring those within um, the, the multi-SNP chip to sort of create consistency and integrate all the, the previous research. Um, and then there was a small component of neutral loci as well. But ultimately, the, the final selection of um, SNP was essentially a, a cohort of informative SNP uh, that was spaced evenly across the entire genome. And we landed on about uh, 5,000 odd for, for herring. So this is kind of some of the most early examples of the sort of testing and validation of the, the SNP array. And so this visualizes uh, 20 individuals uh, across about 4,300 SNP. Um, and you see in the PCA plot here, um, good separation between the various populations of individuals that were sampled. Um, it actually quite nicely follows geographical um, spacing. So we have individuals from the Baltic through to the transition zone and then out to the UK. And then we have the Norwegian samples uh, up the top here. We can also kind of, uh, from this data set, look at, at uh, a GWAS contrast. So separating individuals based on spring spawning versus autumn spawning. Uh, and this is what we see at the bottom here. Um, and we essentially see peaks in regions that we would expect uh, with TSHR being uh, the highest signal uh, inherent um, within this data set, which is nice to see. So we were quite happy with how this was developing. Um, and so we wanted to continue looking at potential applications and development pipelines um, and largely figure out what we could do with the, the DRA. Um, I guess from a fisheries perspective, uh, one of the most desirable outcomes is to produce uh, population assignment tools. And so Leif showed uh, this sort of spatial map previously that highlights all the regions that have previously had pool seek allele frequency um, reference samples collected. Um, so it has quite good spatial coverage, um, but some of the issues with uh, assignment tools is this is just an example of a sign pop. Um, is generally they create uh, reference training sets using different percentages of uh, the training data set. So they might use 50, 70, or 90% of the data and then reassign uh, the remainder to create the, the baselines. Um, with allele frequency data, uh, uh, pulse seed data, you only have one sample potentially per site. Uh, so this can uh, make things a little bit tricky. So basically the pulsing data was, is the most extensive data set we have for this. Um, so we wanna be able to utilize it. Um, 
So what the approaches that we took was to take the individual, the, the samples from the pool seat data, uh, and then filter them through essentially for each site that is present within the array, uh, re-simulate individuals back out from that pool seat data, uh, and then use that as a, a reference data set uh, for the array. So this is what we see here on the right. Um, I guess the most important outcome of this is that we recover all of the previously established uh, populations. Um, and you can see that they actually fit quite well. Uh, so this is the simulated data set and then the original one here. So all of the, the seven populations are there um, and they look quite nice and quite well separated. Um, so we're quite happy with this. So how you go about sort of splitting this uh, reference data set um, can lead you to different applications. Um, so I guess the, the most simple example is to just simply use the, the seven primary groups. And so this is an example of that application. So this is looking at IC statistical rectangle 40G4. Um, so this is basically a region in the south of uh, Sweden. And so this is uh, multiple samples taken across various quarters of the year, uh, taken within this region. And then for those specific halls, we can assign individuals based on the major groups and get some idea of the composition inherent within those stocks and how they track across the, the various time periods of the year. So for example, in the first quarter, we have individuals that are primarily Baltic Spring in origin. And then as we move towards the quarter three and quarter four, the composition becomes increasingly mixed. We can also illustrate here that in the fourth quarter, these are two separate halls taken within the same sort of uh, quarterly period and have quite different profiles. So this sort of suggests that this kind of approach, it would probably be quite good to take uh, repeated samples uh, to get a, a more clear estimation of the, the composition profiles. We can also use some of the information inherent within the pool seat data. So for example, there's information around the uh, spawning periods of individuals. So this is an example of taking a, uh, a group of roughly 800 individuals and then profiling them against the, the reference data sets and getting information about uh, what the spawning period is for those individuals. So we have primarily spring spawners in this group uh, with a mix of autumn and summer spawners as the remainder. And then I guess we have the more classic examples, which is taking an individual hall and then reassigning them to this simulated baseline reference data set, uh, and then having them uh, mapped onto a geographical space. So this is uh, Baltic samples uh, that were taken. And we largely see them mapping back to regions within the Baltic, primarily being Baltic spring individuals uh, with some uh, Baltic autumn and a small percentage of uh, transition zone individuals. Uh, I will say that this is uh, partially dependent on the, the reference baseline samples that you have available to you. Um, and ultimately, I, I kind of view the simulated approach as sort of an intermediary uh, with eventually a more comprehensive uh, sort of sampling occurring that will sort of phase out the the, the simulation approach. But for the moment, um, it is working quite well um, and it's quite handy to utilize the data sets that we have available to us. So from this point on, um, I will talk about a somewhat separate project um, and uh, stepping away from the simulated data as a whole. So this is purely looking at genotypes coming from the, the SNP chip. Um, so this is a population study looking at two populations from Yavlobukhtin. So this is the orange group up here, which is just north of Stockholm, and then Hannibalkton, which is a site in the south of Sweden. Uh, and this is a collaborative project between uh, Uppsala University, SLU Aqua, uh, the Marine Center in Simlesan, and the Swedish Environmental Research Institute. So this is a just a sort of raw PCA plot of um, the data that comes from this sampling. Um, I have purposely not colored any of it to sort of illustrate that the, the outputs that we see are often quite messy. Um, with various different clusters occurring. Um, and this is not necessarily a, a signal that we are unfamiliar with. The, the SNP array itself um, 
has uh, quite a bit of redundancy within the inversion sites, uh, the inversion regions. Um, and this is partially by design. Uh, there's a lot of interesting biological information within the inversions. Uh, so we want to be able to clearly uh, investigate them. Uh, but they have the potential to overwhelm some of the signal. So we need to have certain strategies to maybe com combat that or minimize that a little bit. One approach that we have been taking is to uh, try to reduce the, the variation within the, the inversion. So this is, for example, chromosome 12 uh, with the inversion site highlighted here. And then using some kind of scoring system, we can reduce that down to sort of a single SNP value um, as opposed to the entire inversion uh, itself. But obviously we need to be able to score uh, the sites within the, the, the data sets. Um, and the approach that we've been taking is to look at these north-south haplotype um, scores that have been previously established in Han et al. in 2020. So for all four of the inversions for herring, um, the haplotypes of northern southern haplotypes have been scored. So this is, again, just for chromosome 12. Um, uh, we can see that the northern haplotype, which is represented in yellow, is more prevalent within sort of Norway, Norway Iceland, and the Baltic, whereas the southern haplotype for this inversion is more uh, prevalent within sort of the UK area. So we can kind of use these assignments uh, and build, uh, I guess, a reference set. Um, so for the northern sites, I used Iceland, Greenland, and Norway, which are these sort of block here, which are the sort of most uh, pure versions of the northern um, sites. And then similarly for the southern sites, I used Isle of Man, Celtic Sea, and the Downs area, which are some of the more pure versions of the southern haplotype. So those uh, reference sets are visualized here for, again, chromosome 12 specifically. Uh, and so we have the northern reference here and the southern re reference here. And then we can take in our data from the SNP array and then score them against these references. So you can see for each site, we can tick along and give them a, a nomination based on which one they match most closely with, and then give an overall assignment. Um, so for these individuals here, they are being ultimately assigned to the northern haplotype, which is the yellow one here. And then we have individuals that are southern and then individuals that are uh, heterozygous. Uh, a nice side effect of this um, is you can very easily pull out haplotype frequencies um, from this data. So this is, is an example of the frequency of the southern haplotype across chromosome 12. Uh, and this just illustrates that uh, Hannah Buchton, which is the more southern of the two sites, generally has a higher frequency of the southern haplotype as one might expect. Um, relative to Yavlopultin, which is a bit more in the north. And this kind of score, uh, the haplotype frequencies might be quite interesting, particularly in herring, because some of the inversions have uh, associations with various interesting biological factors, such as spawning season or uh, thermal tolerance or salinity to tolerance. So, okay, going back to our original sort of messy PCA. Um, so we can go through score, uh, each of the inversions. Uh, so each of the four inversions will get this process uh, assi of assignment. And then we can reduce the, uh, based on the assignment, we can reduce them down to sort of uh, an appropriate uh, SNP genotype call appropriate to the haplotype itself. And what this results in is a, a I guess, a more clean uh, PCA plot, uh, which sort of allows us to more easily understand the population patterns inherent within that. So here we have very clear separation um, between the autumn spawning individuals across the data set with the remainder of the Hannah Buchton and Yavla Buchton spring individuals occurring on the left here. So we can very clearly now see the, the split between the spawning seasons. We also, I have highlighted uh, in orange, a sort of interesting ecotype of herring that we are tracking in the Avlibuktan area. Uh, so it is interesting. It, it has some variation in uh, body weight uh, and some potentially shifts in trophic niche. 
So we wanted to have a look at that individually. Uh, and we can see that in this example, they are primarily spring spawning uh, in origin, but they are slightly displaced within the, the PCA plot, um, suggesting that there is some genetic variation inherent within this group. So the array also supports some of these more fine scale analyses. Um, so in this example, this is a, a GWAS uh, looking at all spring spawners within the Yadla Bookton area, uh, but looking specifically at the, the, the ecotype in question. Um, and we can see that as suspected, they are in general quite similar to the, the spring spawners, except for four very specific regions. So over chromosome 10, 15, 17, and 19. Um, so this kind of suggests that the, this ecotype is uh, genetically unique um, and it hasn't previously been documented um, within the Baltic herring. Uh, how, how this uh, genetic variation arises, uh, we're still investigating, but they seem to potentially have some uh, distinct migratory behaviors or some behaviors that may uh, have them be isolated from the more abundant populations uh, within the Baltic herring. And then I guess to sort of conclude, um, the overall, the, the multi-fish SNP chip uh, is quite a powerful tool uh, for assessing population genetics in Atlantic herring. Um, it supports population assignment uh, and characterization of various stock compositions. Uh, looking at uh, scoring of haplotype frequencies uh, and the detection of uh, more fine scale or unique populations and characterization of those ecotypes as well. Um, I will say this is definitely a developing space. There is uh, a lot of interest to integrate the, the array more and more within uh, a fisheries framework, which means that over time we will continue to develop and get a very much more clearer view and overview of the general genetic trends uh, within this population. So I'm very excited to see this develop in future. Um, and I guess uh, watch this space, I would say. Thank you, Jake, for this wonderful talk as well. Um, so I think in the in the in the beginning I, I forgot to to say where I come from. So I'm uh, I'm a group leader in genomics at the uh, at CBU Biopolis at the University of Porto, uh, Portugal. Um, so we have now time for questions. I see that um, there are uh, questions in the in the chat. If you want to um, post some questions, uh, uh, speaking, just just raise your hand. Uh, I also see that that they've already re re responded to some yeah. some yeah. questions, but I, I will read them anyway because people in YouTube don't. I don't think they have access to the okay, chat. Okay. okay. Um, so there's one uh, first question by Hannes uh, Svardal that asked about the price. If the twenty euros per snip ship uh, are per sample costs, and so they've uh, confirmed, right? They've um, then. Um, uh, Kostas uh, Tsiganopoulos um, asked, uh, is this a usual 5760K affymetrics array in which you can theoretically accommodate, uh, for example, 15 species for three to four K SNPs per species or potentially more markers for fewer species? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, the thing. Yeah. So so for yeah. most most cases, three to 4,000 is overkill. But this is what we, what we could put together at this stage. So we had these seven species, and hopefully with some years, we have many more species that we could include. So, and we could, and one could also mix any species, basically, you know, plants and, and fish on the same, if you have a specific project where you would like to do it. So what you, what you get, you, you, you uh, hybridize your DNA to the array, but you, you only read your, the species you're interested in on, on a given experiment. Yeah. Um, so Camilla Mazzoni um, asked, what are the strategies to have representative and balanced population samples for developing formative markers? Uh, I'm thinking from sampling design to preliminary genetic screening. How should one go along starting such a plan from zero for exploited fish? I mean, 
what we know from the be beginning is where spawning take place. And, that, and for species like, like herring, there is a lot of background information where they know that these are spawning in this area and, and, and so on. And, and, and the, so you start by sampling those and to get the, a picture of what, how the differentiation are. And, but you could say that, for instance, this new ecotype that we discovered recently, which may even be a subspecies of, of, of herring, and that was not known. It's spawning at the same place as other populations do, but we detected it when we did use the SNP ship on many more samples because you could do larger. So, so I think this is, is a iterative process. You start with what you know, and, and, and then you, you go from there. Because I think if you have, so, so what we're doing at the moment, we do whole genome sequencing of this new ecotype, because it may be that they will have other regions we haven't seen before, because they may have a special type of adaptation. But I, but I, but I would be surprised if they don't show any difference at, at these 4,000 markers that we have on the array. So, so we detect them as a distinct population, and then we do further studies. So I would say an iterative process. Uh, feel free uh, who posted the questions then to follow up if you have uh, follow up questions on 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 the leaves in uh, yeah. Jake's answers. Um, a question about genetic load. Yes. So so, so why? So let me just <laughs> read the yeah. question because of okay, people in, in YouTube. Yeah. Uh, so Francesca Raffini, uh, is it possible to share more details about how you estimated genetic load? Yeah. So so uh, you know the. the this is this thing with inversion that if you if you read papers about inversion, people often discuss this that because inversion block recombination, which reduce effective population size, you should see an accumulation of genetic load. Uh, and what we have been doing here is that we, we we look at so one of the things you see is accumulation repeats because you don't have such efficient purifying selection. Another is that you see accumulation of of missense mutations frame shift mutations and so on. And in this case, we see nothing of that. There's no, so this inversion region does not differ at all from other regions of the genomes with regard to repeat content or DNDS or, or anything like that. And, and we think the reason is that this is, these inversions play a key role in ecological adaptation, which means that there are a lot of homozygotes of both types in different populations. So in some populations, one dominate so in this case, in fact, all show this northern southern gradient. So if you go, if you fish in the uh, Celtic Sea, which is one of the most southern area that, where the herring is spawning, then you find they, most of them are homozygous for the southern haplotype at all four. If you take fish from Greenland, they will be homozygous for the northern allele at all four. And that, that means that you have really efficient purifying selection over time. And they're old, so they have been over this. So, yeah. Then we have a question by Ricardo Pereira. So how can summary statistics based on SNPs, for example, PI or theta, um, how can it be translated into current effective population size and ultimately inform uh, fish quotas? Can we use a mutation rate to get uh, to an absolute number of individuals per population? So I think the, the problem is that PI and theta so much reflect long-term effective population size. And, and the thing is that, in fact, herring has surprisingly low theta. Uh, it has like 0.3, given that it, the, the, the breeding stock at the moment is something like 10 to the 12, so a trillion individuals. And, and still it has a, not, not that high. So, so I think it's because it went through bottlenecks during glaciations. It, it spawned close to the sea where, where there was ice. And uh, so, so, so I think it may not be easy to use pi and theta for, so you need more sophisticated analysis to that. I, I think the, the, the really important aspect for, for fish is that to get a better understanding of the, of the population structure, how many populations there are. And I, I think, you know, when I did this work more than 40 years ago as a, as a student, and we said that it looks like it's a single pamicli population and it's the complete opposite, it's, it's fascinating. But the thing is that, that there could be this, I, I'm really curious to study this Norwegian spring spawning stock, if that is a single pamicli population, because they have, 
they spawn at the coast of Norway, then migrate up in the Arctic Sea, come back and stays in the fjords, and then get down on the coast for spawning. So they, so maybe that is a group of herring that has uh, belong to a single Pamiki population that would be huge. There. But then besides that, there are local populations everywhere, basically, where we look. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, Monica Mora asked, I think if you already uh, answered to that question, is it possible to develop a snip shift for different taxonomic groups? So mixing fish, plants, yeah, birds, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, Monica also asked whether there is any genetic information on the Azorian eels. We, we don't, we haven't looked at Azorian eels and that would of course be interesting because it's an extreme part of the distribution, but I, I would be surprised if there is yeah, any, I mean, what, what could be possible is that there is more hybridization to American eel that you also see on Iceland, for instance. So. Yeah, then Teresa asked um, Teresa Manosaki, uh, what would be the pros and cons of having one big snip array with many species compared to having more uh, small ones with fewer uh, targeted species? And I think Costas has uh, made a suggestion, maybe the cost per sample in smaller arrays and the potential greater discount you'll get from the array producer for broader use of an array to multiple target species. Yeah. That, that, that's the whole idea behind that as we did it this way and um, because we in the, in the beginning we thought maybe the number of arrays that will be used for herring will not be sufficient to, to justify the cost to make the ship so by, by doing seven species we share the cost so so i think it's better to have many species and share the development cost um, but of course there's a limit depending on how many snips you would like to have on the array Okay, so now we have a question for Jake <laughs> uh, from Camilla. Uh, do you use any linkage as equilibrium information in the SIMP analysis? Uh, within the inversion seems to be straightforward as you showed, but what about outside of the inversions? Mm. So we are kind of currently investigating how best to use uh, linkage information. There is very strong linkage across the array, um, which means that if you apply even sort of minimal filters, you can very easily lose a lot of information. Um, so yeah, at the moment, we're kind of optimizing how best to integrate this kind of approach, maybe looking at linkage through sort of restricted bins um, in the hopes that we don't lose everything essentially. Uh, but for the moment, we're, we're still sort of developing, integrating that kind of info. But what I could make a comment on, and it's <clears throat> something which is, we, we, you could see on these plots that Jake showed is that, in fact, something which is beautiful when we have many SNPs across an inversion, we see rec that recombination is taking place. So we see haplotypes, recombinant inversion haplotypes. And I'm pretty sure that we also see selection in the Baltic Sea because we see some haplotypes at a high frequency only in the Baltic Sea, but not outside. So, so I think it's a dynamic process how this, and by having this, so maybe we, what we, we should take advantage of that as well in, in the analysis of the data. So, so we never see if you just had a, one or two snips from the inversion region. So. Yeah, okay, so now another, another question for Jake from Teresa Manusaki. Uh, is the code for building the inversion aware PCA available? It would be super useful for the rest of the community. Uh, not yet, but uh, I guess the hope is to have it made available at some point, yes. Oh, yeah, here, to... yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So we have here another question. Based on observed patterns of allele frequencies in herring, uh, have you estimated what level and patterns of fishing pressure might affect those frequency patterns? Uh, we may need GWAS aiming uh, SNP ships to address fisheries induced evolution on growth or, or age at uh, first reproduction. Mm. I think this is also sort of related with the, the NE uh, yeah. question. Yeah, as a, my, my view is that, you know, it, it looks like now that most countries that is monitoring, in this case, herring fishery, will start using this array. So in 10 years time, we will have a fantastic data set with this cohort by cohort and so on. And, and then we could start to ask all these questions, how they vary from cohort to cohort. 
and also depending on cell fishing pressure, how that will affect the population. So, so, so I think this will be a, a wonderful resource for fishery biology and, and, and management of, of commercial fishing. Yeah. Now we have here a question from Alice Mouton, um, more of a logistic question. Um, how long did it take or does it take to build the array and what would be an estimated cost for the full process? So uh, I can't tell exactly. Uh, so this Thermo Fisher made, uh, made the array, but I think uh, Thermo Fisher need an upfront payment or uh, or a commitment from a from a consortium that that would like to use it, so to speak. So so they know that they will get the money back. But in this case, it was a company that took that initial cost because they wanted to establish themselves in this market, so to speak. And and and, and it came down to this that they set the price for twenty euro per fish, which include DNA preparation. But the, the more so so the more samples that are used, this cost can drop to even lower levels because the, the cost for the array is dependent on how many have many samples have been used on that array. So but we think it's a really convenient way for do these population studies that you just send them tissue samples and, and you get SNP in a type back. So just a follow up because yeah. um sorry my question was about like even from the genome assembly if what is if someone so the the company took the the cost so that would end up as 20 euro per samples but even when you start from like genome assembly with sequencing you know um, yeah yeah if someone I mean, the, wanted to, to do it yeah, from scratch yeah i mean you could say so so the 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 the, the, the what takes most time would be to do, do high quality genome assembly i would say so, so that that is so. In our case, you know, we 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 had genome assembly that we've done before. We have done the population sequencing. Then we selected the SNP that we consider most informative, plus neutral markers as a reference, and then we shipped or, or <laughs> sent the files with with the SNPs and the flanking sequence, and then they designed it. So, so from that we send them. The, the SNPs in a file, it took a few months to have the, to have the manufacturing done. So. Uh, now, Teresa has a question. If you were to build this array again, uh, as I hope that all of us will do for all other important species, um, what would you change or improve? Uh, I think it, it's only the, the more data you have, the better it is to put a design. Um, so one thing is, of course, you could think about how many how many SNPs do you need for the what, what. So I mean, it depends exactly what you need to do. I mean, how many population do you need to keep track of? I think herring would be one that you would like have quite few because we have many uh, dimensions of, of adaptation. But it could be other species where we have much fewer. So for instance, we have a paper on. On the horse mackerel, which has much fewer regions of the genomes that show differentiation, so then you need fewer markers to, to track them. So, so the more data you have to start with, uh, information that then that help you to design how many how many markers do you need and which one you should use. I would I would like because we should end in two minutes, so I would like to make a proposal and 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 the proposal you will see in fact the slide that I missed to show. So I my proposal is that BGE should. Do, do high quality assemblies for 30 of the most important marine species used for fishery. And it doesn't need to be fish, all of them. And, and the motivation is that these species are all uh, critical for, for the ecosystem because they are abundant and they play an important role in the ecosystem. Uh, to, if, we, if we make the assemblies, they will be a big resource for future population studies, and it will be a contribution to sustainable fishery in Europe. So I think that will be a wonderful delivery, deliverable from, from the project. And, and um, so that is my suggestion. I nominated six species in, in the previous round and all was rejected, which I was disappointed with, but I hope that we could get 30 in the next round instead. Yes, so thank you very much, Leif. Uh, Jake, 
for your wonderful talks uh, and uh, this uh, everyone for for the the great Q and A, and I think it was a wonderful start for our um, for our seminar series. Um, so thank you everyone and have a, a nice day. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Leif. Thank you, Jake. Thank you.